Okay, we'll let the, those who will be coming in uh, more slowly uh, enter in and we'll go ahead and begin now. So we are, as you can tell here, we are now up at panel four and we're sort of moving out in these concentric circles and we've now arrived at uh, Asia in a global context, uh, having moved from the regional level all the way out. Um, so this panel will be moderated by Professor Shigata Bose, who is the Gardner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs here at Harvard University. And then uh, in order of, of appearance and uh, presentation then, uh, our, the speaker just to uh, Professor Bose's left is Manjuri Chatterjee Miller, who is a senior fellow of India, Pakistan, and South Asia at the Council on Foreign Relations. And she's also an associate professor of international relations and the director of the Rising Powers Initiative at the Frederick and S. Pardee School of Global Studies uh, across the river at Boston University. And then uh, to her left is Aniket De, who is a PhD student in history at Harvard University. And uh, to his left then is Ensung Ho, who is a professor of cultural anthropology at Duke University, and the Mohammed Al-Gil, -Al uh, distinguished visiting professor of Arabia Asia Studies at the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. And uh, uh, to Ensung's uh, left is Professor Karen L. Thornber, who is the Harry Tuckman Levin Professor in Literature and the Professor in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, and is currently serving as the interim chair of the Regional Studies East Asia program here at Harvard University. And also uh, the other, um, this morning you heard from Arthur Kleinman, the former director of the Asia Center, and uh, Professor Thornber was my immediate predecessor, so uh, as a director. And then uh, finally on the uh, far end is Ambassador Shayam Saran, who is the president of India International Center and foreign, former foreign secretary of India uh, and the Indian, former Indian ambassador uh, to Myanmar, Nepal, and Indonesia. So um, I will turn it over uh, to Professor Bose to moderate this panel, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, James, and uh, warm congratulations for organizing this uh, spectacular conference. Uh, welcome, everyone, to panel four. Uh, of this conference in honor uh, of our dear friend uh, Ezra Vogel uh, to discuss Asia in a global context. Giovanni Arighi contended in his 2007 book, Adam Smith in Beijing, that when the history of the second half of the 20th century will be written in a long perspective, the odds were that no single theme will prove to be of greater significance than the economic renaissance of East Asia. That renaissance in turn suggested that Adam Smith's prediction of an eventual equalization of power between the conquering West and the conquered non-West might finally come true. China's economic rise led Arighi to confidently predict in 2007 the realization of Smith's vision of a world market society based on greater equality among the world civilizations, more likely than it ever was in the almost two and a half centuries since the publication of The Wealth of Nations. Our first panelist, Manjuri Chatterjee Miller, author of the recent book, Why Nations Rise, shortlisted for the Headley Bull Prize, has argued that national narratives are quite as important as material factors in changing the global balance of power. Even in the era of Western imperial domination of Asia, anti-colonial thinkers and political activists from Turkey to Japan through South and Southeast Asia advanced alternative visions of a global future. Okakura had famously proclaimed in 1903, Asia is one, and he was instrumental in getting Rabindranath Tagore to come to Harvard to deliver five lectures in 1913. <laughs> we can expect our second panelist, Oniket De, currently writing a path-breaking dissertation <laughs> on imperial and anti-colonial lineages of federalism, to give us a glimpse of the more creative visions of federation that emanated from Asia. The Asian continent has for long had an imbricated relationship with the Indian Ocean that undergirds it. Our third panelist, Eng Seng Ho, has not only studied 500 years of interaction across the ocean, 
but is now engaged in studying the dynamics of the global port cities of Asia that have appeared on its edges. He was, of course, impishly suggesting to me last evening at dinner that we should retitle our panel as Asia in a deglobalizing context. <laughs> the challenge of imagining Asia in the age of contemporary globalization and deglobalization must wrestle with the tension between economy and culture. The sharpest critical insight into the dilemma of searching for an inclusive cultural matrix comes from Gayatri Spivak. She sternly reminds us that regional economic initiatives that may seem unifying do not provide a specifically cultural cement, but rather produce a global managerial culture. In her book, Other Asias, she speaks of an effort that must be renewed again and again with no guarantees in the name of Asia's pluralized. Our fourth panelist, Karen Thornba, is a humanist scholar of Asian literatures in a comparative vein and can tell us if we are seeing the new blossoming of an interreferential Asian arts and the humanities. Our final pa panelist, Sham Saran, is a very distinguished practitioner from the world of diplomacy and the author of a new book, How China Sees India and the World. The vital issue of what the rise of China means for the rise of Asia in the early 21st century has been addressed by the great Singaporean historian, Wang Gangwu, in an appendix to his thought-provoking book titled Renewal. The idea that a state be constituted from one nation, he writes unambiguously, only emerged in 18th century Europe. He juxtaposes to that rigid idea, the concept of Tiangxia, a vision of universality that was different from the idea of empire as exemplified in the Roman Imperium. Tiangxia signified an enlightened realm. Modern Chinese scholars were divided on the question whether such a concept could be the foundation of a Chinese multinational republic. One far-sighted classical scholar who believed that it could was Gu Hong Ming, whom the Indian visitor Binoy Kumar Sharkar had met in Shanghai during his search for a young Asia in 1916. Gu Hong Ming's writings, Wang Gang Wu had noticed, had been recently revived in China. Gu Hong Ming had asked the big questions about what China once stood for, not nation or empire, but a moral tiangxia that had something to teach the world. This meditation on an intellectual of the early 20th century led Wang Gang Wu to ponder what kind of China is now rising. Can it avoid being a nation state that when powerful will emulate the national empires or will it be a benign and peace-loving multinational state? Renewal was published in 2013 when the second possibility represented hope for the future. Since then, has Gu Hong Min's vision been swept aside by the thought of Xi Jinping? So enough from me in the form of prefatory remarks. We have an excellent panel with a political scientist, a historian, an anthropologist, a literary scholar, and a diplomat, which should make for a scintillating conversation. So Manjari, to set us on our way. Um, so let me just start by thanking the Asia Center and James. Uh, this, is a, this is an invitation I never would have refused. Ezra Vogel was a, a giant in the field. Uh, and I was deeply honored to be asked to uh, talk about his legacy. But I think one of the perks has been seeing so many old friends. It has been wonderful to actually see you all after the pandemic and, and hear your thoughts and, and your work. So uh, with that, let me just begin by saying that um, I think one of the things that has been said many times today is how uh, Professor Vogel's work connected not just borders, countries across borders, but was interdisciplinary, right? So he connected different disciplines. And this had a profound effect in many different fields, right? And particularly uh, for the study of China, um, as well as for the study of Japan. 
But interestingly, and today, you know, Shubhat asked me to talk about my book, but before I even do that, I want to set that in the context of studying Indian foreign policy. You see, Indian foreign policy for a long time was untouched by these breakthroughs that was actually happening uh, in the study of China, uh, in the study of Japan, um, you know, and, and other countries. Let me explain what I mean. So essentially, in political science, and particularly in my field in international relations, uh, there was the dominance of certain theoretical paradigms. And particularly two theoretical paradigms were very important, uh, you know, realism and neorealism, uh, which argued that, that power mattered for countries uh, as they sought to emerge in the world and as they sought to protect their security. Now, the problem with these theories were that they were essentially designed to explain the behavior of states with power enough to matter. That did not include India. India did not have power enough to matter. And so basically by drawing on cases of, of uh, mostly Western states, you had entire theoretical paradigms that were built to explain the behavior of every state. Now compounded by this problem was the fact that um, theorists who did study India or political scientists or empiricists who did study India tended to treat it as a unique case. Right? And because you had these dominant theoretical paradigms, they would look at Indian behavior, and rather than actually uh, you know, assessing why India was doing what it did, would take that behavior and attempt to fit it into those two, the two theoretical paradigms. India must be doing what it did because of the pursuit of power, and therefore uh, they kind of bent over backwards, essentially, to explain Indian behavior in those terms. Now, what was really interesting is that for a long time then, um, you know, there was a, a, a given in the theoretical literature and in the literature in Indian foreign policy of uh, power as interest, and that is a given. And then after the Cold War, uh, you know, with the, with the uh, decline of the Soviet Union, uh, there was another reckoning, which is that, you know, if India had been, had, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, had not taken certain positions in international relations that we would have expected it to take uh, during the Cold War, uh, how would we explain shifts? So then this, uh, the way that was explained was that, well, you know, uh, India had uh, for a long time been deluded and had made a lot of mistakes in its foreign policy, and now it was waking up to this fact that its interests were paramount, and now it was pursuing its interests. And what that, of course, does is it, um, it, it, it divorces interests from other variables that could actually constitute it. Right? So the fact that interests could be things that are power, but also things that are not power, or not defined by material terms, was completely ignored. Right? So this idea of interest uh, became uh, really, really uh, important. Now, what we have learned since, and particularly in the last 10 years in, of studying Indian foreign policy, which has actually been wonderful, because there are a lot of very young scholars, really, really talented scholars who have been um, inventing new theories, new paradigms to explain Indian behavior. Uh, what we find is that interests can actually be shaped by a large number of variables. And the previous panel, in fact, mentioned uh, some of these as well, but I'll lay them out for you. Uh, you can have states who have who prioritize interests as historical legacies. Uh, you can have interests represented as ideas. You can have bureaucratic structures that come up and that matter when it comes to the making of foreign policy. Uh, you can have epistemic communities that actually matter when it comes to for making foreign policy. Now, all of these in India's case was particularly important, I think, because India, China too, but India particularly, uh, has often taken very peculiar positions in international relations uh, that are not really easily explainable uh, by, you know, by these old theories that, 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 that were set in place to explain the behavior of the, of the West. And so therefore, uh, I think in the last 10 years, you see people like Rohan Mukherjee, for example, who work on status and how um, you know, status, uh, status matters for India. Uh, you have people like Rafael Khan uh, who work on bureaucracy and how bureaucracies matter. You have people like Avinash Baliwal who works on espionage and how structures, uh, you know, these structures of, that, that take place in the intelligence community, how that can matter for Indian foreign policy. Now, the other thing that was brought in that was always existed in China's case but didn't exist in the study of India was the comparative context. Right? So, you know, Ezra, uh, Ezra Vogel studied China and, you know, famously studied Japan and then he studied China and you had these wonderful comparative um, arguments that took place and that also did not exist uh, in Indian foreign policy because of this treatment of India as unique. 
And so what you see more and more today uh, is the comparison <coughs> of India with other countries, particularly with China, which I think started in the, in the 1990s, but also with other countries uh, such as Japan or India's integration uh, into, uh, into the uh, strategies of other countries. Uh, John and I today over lunch were having a wonderful conversation about the Quad, for example, and how those external factors can actually affect Indian foreign policy. So you see a richness and a depth to it that has, that, that, you know, Ezra Vogel's legacy created, but came late to the study of Indian foreign policy. Uh, which brings me uh, to, to the book that, that Professor Bose asked me to talk about, which is Why Nations Rise, uh, where I really think that I reaped the benefit uh, you know, of, of the people who blazed a trail in identifying variables that matter and then also actually uh, you know, pointing out that comparisons across countries could be really useful. So in Why Nations Rise, I look at uh, rising states. I look at rising powers and I say, look, uh, what are rising powers? We don't really ever identify them. And so what I do is I look at six cases of uh, countries that had the opportunity to rise uh, and either embrace that opportunity in certain ways or were reticent about that opportunity. And I look at the United States uh, at the turn of the, um, you know, the late 19th century. I look at major Japan uh, in the late 19th century. I look at Cold War Japan. I look at the Netherlands in the late 19th century. And then I look at uh, China and India in the 1990s. And I think what was particularly interesting about the Chinese and Indian case in the 1990s is that um, China had very different behavior from India in the 1990s. And what I realized was that when we talk about rising powers, we tend to talk about it as a singular category of actors, when in fact you have different kinds of rising powers. Not all rising powers are the same. And so China and India's rising powers didn't behave the same way in the 1990s. Um, you know, China was an active rising power and India stayed reticent. And so what I found was that even though at that time you could compare them materially, that was the period in which China had not outstripped India in terms of its capabilities, um, there was, a, there was a distinct difference in how they saw and thought about the world. So Chinese narratives in the 1990s actually changed, and they really start talking about China's rise and China's rising power. Uh, and I think what's particularly interesting about it is that China starts behaving in ways that are very accommodational um, at that time in the international system. And part of it is because you know, in every era when you have a great power and a rising power is a country that's rising to become a great power, you say, well, how do I get recognized as a great power? I want to be like them. And the them for China was the United States. And so a lot of what you see in the 1990s is China integrating into the international order. Uh, and along with its uh, material capabilities, you see a plethora of narratives. You know, these narratives of how should China rise? What should it do? How should it become a great power? How does it become like the United States? Uh, you know, uh, and all of that uh, changes Chinese narratives uh, from, the, from, from the past, which had really been about rejecting uh, some of these notions. Now, what happened in India was very different. In India in the 1990s, uh, these narratives were about Indian, for, about Indian foreign policy, which existed in plethora, were very internal. They were really about internal development. Of India, but they were not external. They were not outward facing. They were not about India rising to become a great power. They were not about how does India, uh, you know, rise vis-a-vis -vis China or the United States or how India changes its position. They really looked at India's economic development uh, and about unifying the country across its diversity. So they were very domestically focused, and the result, I think, was that you had different behavior on the world stage. Now. Coming back to just you know squaring, coming back to the point uh, about domestic politics, which you know Andy made uh, in his presentation, Selena made that point as well. Uh, so did John, uh, which is this is where domestic politics becomes really important uh, because when you look at why certain countries develop narratives and certain countries don't, I don't have a great answer for you because that's not something I look at in my book. But I do know that bureaucratic structures can make a difference, like capacity can make a difference. And if you look at India's foreign policy structure, it's very, very different, as <laughs> Ambassador Saran will testify, from the Chinese foreign policy structure. And so in India, you'd had a, a, there was a distinction between the people who were making foreign policy and, and, and epistemic communities that could feed into that foreign policy. Whereas in China, you had an integration. You, at that time, I mean, it's a little different now under President Xi, but at that time, you had the welcoming of epistemic communities and their input into foreign policy in a way that did not exist in India. Now, that could be one reason why those uh, narratives change. Um, now, the other, I think the last part, point which I want to make is, uh, you know, Professor Vogel also really emphasized the importance of scholarship to policy, right? That good scholarship could inform policy. And I think that is 
particularly true, we know that's true in China's case, but that's also particularly true in India's case. Um, if you look at, for example, the India-United States partnership today, uh, a lot of uh, the scholarship that I think the last has, has come out in the last 10 years really tries to explain why this partnership never really strengthened uh, during the Cold War and tries to look at variables for why this was the case. Because, you know, I mean, now we talk about the United States and India as natural allies, but this is not new, right? I think the first instance I ever found about the United States talking about India as a natural ally and as a counterbalance to China was in 1948, one year after India gains independence. Right? And of course, as we know, nothing happens with a partnership. Uh, it is pretty stagnant, you know, goes back and forth. They're never enemies. But they're certainly never partners, um, you know, for decades. And it is not until, not even the post-Cold War, but it, it is literally in the last, I would say, 10 years <coughs> that you see this massive transformation in the United, in the United States partnership. And it makes me wonder about if we had had scholarship in the past, in the last, you know, in the, during the Cold War that had actually been able to evaluate with theories that were, that were drawn from behavior, not, not just, uh, you know, confined to the West. Uh, what, how could we have understood Indian policy better? Uh, could we have fomented understandings uh, that would have been better uh, during that time? Uh, because today we certainly can. Today you see these writings by, by scholars and analysts that are wonderful. There's a plethora of it out there. It's very rich. Uh, it's very central to understanding Indian foreign policy today. But that simply did not exist before. And so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to people like Professor Vogel who made that happen uh, for, for many countries. And uh, I'm only a little bit sad that in India it took a little while to catch up. But it has. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Manjari, for uh, touching on uh, new approaches to the study of Indian foreign policy by younger scholars, in addition to giving us the nub of your argument in your uh, most uh, recent book. Uh, I'll just say for the moment that whatever else may not have happened in India in the 1990s, it is precisely in that period that you begin to see a new kind of an engagement with Southeast Asia. I think it's, uh, you know, the, in the Narsimha Rao period that you see the early signs of a look east policy. So we may want to think about it later. I can but, come back to that. Yeah. Actually, I have a, that's one of the cases in my book, actually. I see. Okay. All right. And it didn't work that well, you would uh, argue, I imagine. Well, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, now let's turn to uh, Aniket. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Bose. Uh, I thought of uh, beginning my talk by saying, I had not met Ezra Vogel, but then I thought that would not be entirely true. Uh, and the first memory I was struck by uh, that came back to me was reading Japan as number one in my four month stint in Kyoto, made possible by the Asia Center. So in a way, I have been a very real beneficiary of the institutional and scholarly contributions made by Ezra Vogel and for any scholar who influences across generations, as I think is clear through this, through this conference, uh, they live on through their books and their, their writings. And that has been my form of engagement with this great scholar. Although I must emphasize, he's, he's not from my direct field, which is South Asia, but that, that's, not, that's besides the point. The point I wanted to begin with is that one aspect that has stood um, has remained with me from Ezra Vogel's writings is his keen attention to change and, and transformations. Uh, this is something in which I felt his works stood out from much of sociology. And actually last night when I was flipping through the excellent memorial volume that has been produced, which is, I encourage, I hope everyone has read it. And he clearly says he's a product of the social relations tradition at, at, at Harvard, which emphasizes change. Um, that's actually a pretty fundamental insight, I think, for understanding both Ezra Vogel's works, as well as the discipline of history and what it can do for understanding Asia in the global context. I, we have had some wonderful panels on political science and sociology and anthropology and the social sciences from the morning, but. Now I would really like to step back and take a historical look in some sense. And one way to do it is to do a small thought experiment and go back about 100 years to what we now would call Asia. 
Particularly one figure, Binoy Kumar Sharkar, whom Professor Bose mentioned in the introduction, an Indian sociologist who traveled to China in 1917, I believe, and wrote a travelogue. In 16. 16, and a travelogue that was published in 1921. There's a one particular passage in that travelogue when he's taking a train through central China, north China, uh, he's going towards Xi'an, and he looks out into the countryside. And he sees fields of millet and, and wheat, little lamps lighting small huts, uh, people going on their daily chores. When the train reaches a station, the vendors crowd around. And of course, his first insight is this is exactly like India. Mm -hmm. And every time I travel to China, and I quote him here, I am reminded of India because it's the same culture and it's the same food and so on. And he sometimes overstates the case, but he does note a very basic similarity between the two very different contexts. And then he says an extremely significant line in that same travelogue. And he was a sociologist, so he had a habit of switching between travelogue and social theory in every other passage. And the critical line there is, if Bengalis from Kolkata can call Maharashtrian Brahmins and Tamil Brahmins their brothers with so much difference in language and culture and everything, there's no reason why the Indian peasant and the Chinese peasant can't call each other their own kins. And he there, and in fact, that very basic similarity in livelihood, in what anthropologists would call quotidian life and everyday practice, that forms the basis of an Asiatic solidarity for Binar Kumar Sharkar. He makes pretty much the same argument when he travels to Japan, uh, when he travels to West Asia and Egypt. In other words, he's able to see all of Asia being connected through a series of common cultural practices and, and livelihoods. And then he makes another pretty critical remark. He says, if you deny the unity of Asia, you have to deny the unity of India. Because India, too, is a collection of multiple cultures in the same way that Asia is a broader collection of cultures. I mention this story because I think this is where, at the end of the day, the argument for what would be called an Asiatic federation would come from for many of these thinkers, especially in India, and I believe in China, too. That the f argument for federalism within say borders or whatever sort, those borders themselves were fuzzy in the 1920s, depended also on federation without. And, and, and just like multiple cultures could come together and be in one nation state, say the vision of the Indian nation state or the Indian federal state, similarly, there was no reason why different regions of India couldn't cooperate with different regions of China or Southeast Asia. Um, Vinay Sharkar went on to make a, another remark, which is significant given times. He said, the future of China, and he's writing this right in the years of the Chinese Republic, quite turbulent. It's, it's unclear where China would go, I think, in 1916. He says, the future of China lies not in creating one great China, he calls it Mohachin, or, 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 or great China, <laughs> but in multiple smaller Chinas that would all be together and form multiple, uh, a continent of Chinas. Now, today, looking back, it sounds as ludicrous, or, or many people simply dismiss it as, as a dream that, that can't happen. And, and yeah. It would have been, had it not been for the fact that around the same time, there were major Chinese thinkers proposing the format of a United States of China. This is a, a, a somewhat neglected period in, in, in Chinese history. I'm not a Chinese historian, so we can discuss this more during the Q&A. But Proshenjit Dwara, for example, has written very compellingly about how certain narratives of federalist China has been pushed aside by later nation state developments. This is one of those. Uh, we need to go no further than, than even the early Mao Zedong himself uh, calling for a self-contained Hunan within, within China, which caused controversy later. Uh, but, you know, given the spirit of the times, and this is why I think a historical analysis is really crucial, uh, Mao at, at, at the time called for 
at times an independent Hunan or at least an autonomous Hunan within a greater United States of China. This was a very short moment in the 1920s, but it did work. And Hunan, like Bengal in India, had its own tradition of provincial identity and regional identity, at least from the late Ming period. As a result, now again, later historians have been very uncomfortable with, with this sorts of proclamations. And, and, but that discomfort comes only because we take the telos of what happened in the late 1940s and judge the events of the 1920s in relation to it. We have no reason to do so. If we see parallel developments in India, Indian thinkers like Vinay Sharkar, like another major political figure, Chittaranjan Dash, whom, as I, I believe Professor Bose in his new work has, has mentioned, is the first one to come up with the phrase Asiatic Federation in the, in the 1920s. Um, so it was not very uncommon to think in terms of federal Indias and federal Chinas in this period in, 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 in Asia. That's one point I, I wanted to make. The second point to, to ponder upon is that the importance of these ideas are not just historical. I think they, they remain quite relevant even in the present day. Um, it's, sometimes we tend to see history as an explanation of what happened and only what happened. Uh, that's a rather limited view of history, I, I think, and more and more historical research is trying to dislodge that view and point out to the very real alternatives that, that came and were rejected because of historical contingency in different periods of time. Uh, uh, in the same way, I think Asiatic Federation is a topic like that, which because of certain historical events of the 30s and 40s and everything that happened afterwards kind of got lost. But there is no reason why we should abandon that idea and, and not take it seriously. Um, it's quite remarkable how the same idea of federation, which in effect means multiple nations in one state, uh, becomes popular across uh, major Asian regions. I haven't mentioned West Asia yet, but around the same time uh, when the Ottoman Empire was, had not yet dissolved, uh, there were major proposals which sought to imagine the Arab lands and the Turkish lands in a sort of a federal arrangement within the Ottoman Empire. So there is a sort of, I think, a deeper intellectual connection between these family of ideas. And of course, this idea of an Asiatic Federation, I think, has to be put in context of what the, uh, you know, the imperial powers were doing at the time. Uh, the, the, the multiple imperial powers in this region, the region we have been talking about had the British, if you consider Southeast Asia, the French, also in the Middle East, Dutch, American, and, and Japan at, 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 at some parts. Japan's case is, is somewhat different, so I'm leaving that a little apart, but the other, the European powers, had sort of grouped together to create what was then called an imperial federation of sorts. Um, Asiatic Federation, to an extent, was a response to that uh, by you know, a, sort of, a way of Asian anti-colonial leaders to reply to it. But in its essence, I think it also represents a deeper ethic of accommodating multiple cultures and multiple nations within the same polity. Uh, it has also links, if you want to draw a deeper historical lineage, to pre-colonial empires in, 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 in the region, which had managed to do that quite, quite effectively. Uh, I think I'll, I'm out of uh, time now, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up uh, by, by saying that I think a, his, a deeper historical look at change in Asia and the change of political ideas in Asia seen in their own timely context uh, is, is a major way forward in the, in the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Oniket, for uh, excavating and recovering some fascinating political ideas from the early 20th century that may have lost out in the battle for state power in 1947 or 1949, but they are not merely of academic or historical interest, uh, but in fact, when history is connected with normative political theory, uh, show us uh, some way forward in our contemporary uh, predicament. 
we'll come back to some of the questions that you've raised. But now let me turn to Eng Seng Ho. Uh, thank you, Shigato and James, for having me back. I'm happy to be uh, back, but also sad to uh, miss uh, people I used to have uh, nice dinner conversations with. Uh, Ezra Vogel is one of them. Uh, Others I'll mention are uh, Stanley Tambaya and Roger Owen. They, they were part of a, a group of uh, friends and colleagues who knew about areas of the world I was uh, keen on, interested in. Um, but they were also scholars who had two eyes, one eye on concepts and theories and the other eye on the real world out there. And I think this combination is, is, is an important combination to have. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be able to honor uh, Ezra today. In 2016, the world watched, incredulous, as the champions of globalization since Thatcher and Reagan, the UK and the US, voted for Brexit and for Trump. Biden has since ratcheted up the economic nationalism, taking aim at China, the US's key trading partner. This is a good time to revisit Ezra Vogel's work. China today is the world's second largest economy. When Ezra published Japan as number one in 1979, Japan was the world's second largest economy. Um, and viewed as an existential threat to the US. Vogel sailed into the wind regardless and thought the US could learn from Japan. Is there any American Vogel today who would say the same about China. We had an interesting discussion about policy learning just now. Outside of the US and Europe, I believe many feel they could learn and profit from the Asian dragons, big or little. What do Asians think of the US's anti-China push after 30 plus years of globalization and rising living standards? Within the US, China is today's Japan of the 1980s. Three years after Vogel's Japan as number one was published, Vincent Chin, a Chinese-American man mistaken for Japanese, was killed with a baseball bat by two white auto workers in Detroit, blaming Japanese cars for Detroit's woes. Pronounced guilty, they were sentenced to three years probation and a $3,000 fine with no jail time. These weren't the kind of men you sent to jail, the sentencing judge wrote. A similar view of China seems to have become common in the US today. Externally, there is a geostrategic assumption that lies deeper than America's current populist economic nationalism. This is the East and Southeast Asian correlate to Lord Ismay's formula for NATO in Europe, to keep the Russians out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. In Asia, that would be to keep the Chinese out the Americans in, and the Japanese down. Just as the Ukraine war may be seen as resulting from the unbalancing of Ismay's three-legged stool, the anti-China push may be seen as a response to China's going to East and Southeast Asia in a big way economically, as we've heard from Ambassador Chan and Selena Ho. China has transgressed the Ismayan geostrategic formula for stability, and therefore the US pushback seems Intuitive. <clears throat> there has been alarmingly little, little discussion within the US questioning this major anti-China shift. I hope such discussion will start at Harvard. So it will certainly be in Ezra's spirit, which gives me uh, one reason to come here today. <laughs> the question I'd like us to think about is, are there any breaks to Biden's Brexit moment? And I'll if you allow me, dub it Biden's Brexit moment. Will it become a, or will it become a major turning point in history with decoupling a foregone conclusion? Let me share two thoughts on this, one from the US and one from Asia. Now on the US side, the US and China have become what I call mutually addicted to each other. Outsourcing has garnered U.S. corporations high profits of cheap quality goods from China, powering the stock market for decades. Designed by Apple in California, assembled in China, is the proud banner of this addiction. 
Such Chinese imports have allowed corporations to keep nominal wages low by enabling US workers to afford an acceptable standard of living. In macroeconomic terms, outsourced imports have kept US inflation low despite high liquidity since the time of Alan Greenspan. On the Chinese side, US exports have built industrial capacity, lifted 600 million out of poverty, and created the largest group of billionaires in Asia, second only to the US. They have also netted the Chinese government $3.5 trillion of foreign reserves. Now, going by classical Ricardian trade theory, such surplus reserves should push up the yuan, make Chinese exports pricier and drop in volume, while making imports cheaper for Chinese workers to buy and enjoy. Because the currency adjustment has not happened, we can say that the 3.5 trillion USD is essentially a net transfer from the workers of China to their government via exports. The new economic policy frame for China, dual circulation, is precisely a promise by the government to reduce that export mechanism of extraction and distribute more of it to its people via internal circulation. For these reasons, I say the US and Chinese state and society are mutually addicted to each other. Decoupling would be a direct hit on this mutual addiction and benefit. Can the US or China tolerate going cold turkey? Inflation is more money chasing fewer goods. The loss of Chinese supply during the pandemic before Ukraine kicked off inflation in the US. Widening inflation, the subsequent interest rate rise, and plunging stock market give us a sneak preview of the cost of decoupling for the US, and this may just be the beginning. What about the broader response in East and Southeast Asia? This trans region experienced three quarters of a century, of the 20th century, as war. Past the Vietnam War, East and Southeast Asians decided to bracket off intractable political disputes and deal with the smaller problems of production and trade. They were tired of wars over high stakes and bracketed those off, deciding not to make the perfect the enemy of the good. The result was four decades of high growth, which Vogel explained with uncommon command and insight. This consensus to bracket off intractable conflict or kick the can of nationalist politics down the road while putting the nose to the factory floor has been, I uh, suggest, an authentically Asian formula which made Washington consensus globalization work for them. When I directed the Middle East Institute in Singapore, I would take every opportunity to sell this formula to friends in the Middle East as a lesson they could learn from Asia. In the longer view, um, the strength of this consensus was a measure of Asia's exhaustion, I think, from the wars of the 20th century. Time to try something new. As the shine came off globalization in London and Washington, Beijing became the largest trading country and the champion of free trade. Other Asian countries prefer the train of globalization to keep on rolling and are currently, I believe, suffering from whiplash. Now, in this view, Biden's anti-China push crystallized in the 2022 National Security Strategy released just two days ago is an attempt to break this East and Southeast Asian consensus. Indeed, Pelosi's Taiwan trip was widely viewed across the trans region as provocative kicking the can in the opposite direction from the distant future into the immediate present. By refusing to interrupt his staycation while Pelosi was in town, Korean President Yoon essentially was playing political football with her, kicking the can back down the road. If my friends in political science were to take an opinion poll across Asia on Yoon's staycation, not vacation, staycation, I believe they would have a working measure of how strong a breaking force exists in the region against Biden's Brexit moment currently. Now, beyond state-centric views, there may be deeper reasons underlying the popularly shared belief across Asia that Pelosi's visit was a deliberate provocation, 
My evidence comes from my various WhatsApp groups, a low end, no doubt. Um, over four decades of supply chains and inter-Asian engagements, however, I believe Asians have been rediscovering one another through work, tourism, rekindling of kinship, marriages, recognizing familiar things in the other, and perhaps some kind of external federation ideas that you have been talking about. The comfort level with each other has become heightened on a people-to-people -people basis. This may not have crystallized in polls or policy so far. I asked Professor uh, Koichi Nakano at dinner last night about Japanese responses to Biden's anti-China push. He replied that the older generation above 60 were generally for it, but the younger ones were more open to China. His 14-year-old son thinks Korea is entertainment. China is now and wow gadgets, and Japan is boring. <laughs> in Singapore, elites have, become, uh, have been pro-US, or well, heartlanders, or what they call heartlanders, pro-China. As US-China rivalry intensifies and Asian countries are pushed to choose sides, the political processes may crystallize new positions we have yet to see. So does decoupling have legs? Or are the breaking forces I've mentioned strong enough in the US and in Asia to cause the US to backpedal to some degree? Vogel always kept one eye on the US, even as he kept another on Asia. While his methods seemed comparative in the Weberian tradition, his work was actually connective at the same time. That connective perspective is needed ever more today when the US and Asia are living out of each other's pockets. This is why I miss Eng Seng so much. Uh, we used to have such uh, great conversations in the first decade of the 21st century before he left Harvard to go to Duke and, uh, uh, and Singapore. You can always trust him to be incisive and provocative. And I must say that uh, as uh, uh, Oniket was finishing his uh, remarks, I was thinking of Tambi, Stanley Tambaya, as somebody who, as an anthropologist working on Thailand and Sri Lanka, had uh, articulated the, the vision of what true federation ought to look like. We'll come back, Eng Seng, to some of the points that you've made. But now it's time for some poetry. Karen. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much to James and the Asia Center for the opportunity to speak at this incredibly inspiring conference, and to Professor Bose for chairing our panel. I first encountered Ezra as a, as a name on a syllabus. Uh, this was in Princeton professor Gilbert Rosman's Sociology 306, The Heritage of East Asian Societies a course that focused on intra-regional comparisons and connections. Uh, China, Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Singapore, from historical times to the present day. And of course, that present now was some decades ago. In Gil's class, we were introduced to Ezra as a scholar who, as with Gil himself, approached the study of East Asia from a truly transnational, indeed global perspective. From the outset, it was clear that Ezra was a leader among leaders, part of the early generation of East Asia scholars who worked effortlessly across East Asian and regional borders. In addition to Ezra and Gill and Gill's PhD advisor, Marion Levy, he's included one other of my teachers, Professor Marius Jansen, as well as Professor Joe Levinson, Edwin Reischauer, and Ted DeBerry. Ezra remained an inspiration in graduate school, although I still hadn't met him, um, but he was an inspiration as I engaged in work, comparative work, connective work, among early 20th century East Asian literatures. And I wish, Anikit, I had known about the case studies you mentioned, because that would have really filled up my research in inspiring ways. I didn't meet Ezra until about 15 uh, years after I first encountered him on a syllabus, uh, shortly after I joined the Harvard faculty in 2007. I never studied with him. There was no reason he should have known who I was. He had retired uh, before uh, I joined the faculty. But yet, 
it was at a conference. He came right over to me. He knew who I was. He knew what I was doing. He had taken great interest in my work. And he spoke, even then, my first uh, days on the faculty, about the many possibilities for my career at Harvard, given my own trans-Asia scholarship, albeit in literature and cultural history. Some years later, as director of the Asia Center, I always knew I could count on Ezra. He was one of the first colleagues to reach out to me after the announcement of my directorship, and he was always available for a quick chat, a lunch, or a discussion, longer discussion, about all things Asia and Asia Center related. Looking back over the emails he sent me then and throughout my time as director, I'm reminded again of his incredible kindness, his generosity of spirit, as well as his tremendous support of me throughout. Looking over the Asia Center's annual report for 2018-2019, I'm reminded of his eloquent contributions at the former director's panel at the Asia Center's 20th anniversary celebration, and even more importantly and impressively, just how frequently Ezra participated in Asia Center events long after his retirement. What a stalwart presence he remained till the very end. And what a tremendous inspiration to us all as teachers, as scholars, and as leaders. Today, of course, many of our graduate students in literature work on more than one East Asian or Asian literature. This is a transformation of the field that owes quite a bit to Ezra's legitimizing and funding through the Asia Center, uh, Trans-Asia Scholarship. So pivoting now uh, more directly toward the topic of our panel, Asia in Global Context, and inspired by Ezra's insistence on studying and learning from real people and what matters to them, two things come immediately to mind. I'm going to speak briefly now on Asia and gender justice and Asia and climate justice. So I recently finished a book on gender justice through Asian and Asian diaspora literatures. I think immediately we can see the um, insp inspiration of Ezra in this, working across Asian borders, but also within Asian diasporas. Why did I pursue this project? Well, gender inequity and gender-based violence are deeply imbricated with the heteropatriarchal gender norms and systems present across much of the world. Indeed, gender inequity and gender-based violence are the world's most persistent and pervasive pandemics. Women are the largest group treated inequitably because of their gender, including being subjected to physical, sexual, psychological, social, economic, and other harm. The World Bank's 2019 report, Gender-Based Violence, reveals that even before the responses to COVID-19 that intensified gender inequity and gender-based violence in much of the world, one in three women globally, so more than a billion women, and experienced physical and or sexual violence. Still greater numbers of women have been subjected to economic, emotional, mental, and other forms of bias, mistreatment, and abuse that constitute what Jessica Nordell has termed soul violence, assaults on an individual's choices, possibilities, and sense of self. I'm a literature scholar, so naturally I look at to see what literature has to say about this. And for centuries, literature globally, from fiction and poetry to memoir and creative nonfiction, has broken silences, highlighting the ubiquity and brutality of gender inequity and gender-based violence, and exposing their devastating physical, psychological, social, and economic impacts. As Jacqueline Rose has contended, literature shares experiences of violence in ways that defy both the discourse of politicians and the defenses of thought. Literature, Rose continues, takes us deep into parts of the world crying out unambiguously for justice. A scholar of Asia, so naturally I look to Asian literatures. East, South, and Southeast Asia, as well as their diasporas within Asia and around the world, are no strangers to gender inequity and gender-based violence. The World Economic Forum's annual Global Gender Gap Report estimates that at the current pace, it will take East and Southeast Asia more than 165 years, and South Asia nearly two centuries to close their gender gaps. Moreover, literatures from East, South, and Southeast Asia and their myriad diasporas regularly probe the multiple forms of gender inequity and gender-based violence experienced by women and gender and sexual minorities from before birth until after death. 
As I argue my book, again, inspired very much by Ezra and his work, analyzing Asian literatures and trans-regional and global perspectives promises not only to deepen understandings about conditions for women in specific parts of Asia, but also to help us better appreciate the fundamental role gender plays in so much of what happens in Asia and globally. I'd like now to speak briefly about climate justice, which is not unrelated to gender justice. So another project I'm working on, uh, building on my earlier work on environmental challenges and crises in East Asia. This new work is on climate justice and inequality, comparative Asian and global perspectives on past, presence, and futures. So looking more into the past this time. This book, I hope to elucidate core concepts, narratives, and images regarding climate and environmental injustice and inequality across Asia in conversation with other world and cultural regions. I think it's only by taking a global transtemporal and interdisciplinary approach to our current climate crises, as with so many other crises and challenges, that we have any chance of enacting meaningful and equitable change. And Asia must be central to our discussions of climate and particularly climate justice, not only because Asia is 60% of global population and not only because of its long history of colonization and continued conflict with both Western nations and Asian nations closer to home. This year's UN report, Climate Change 2022, Impacts, Adaptations, and Vulnerability, emphasizes global risk while highlighting the even greater precarity of low-income nations. These nations, the majority of which are in Asia, are the most affected by environmental destruction and particularly by climate change, yet they're the least responsible for the emissions that cause climate change in the first place. In the Asia-Pacific, climate change is not something of the future. It's already the present. Asian nations are already being significantly damaged by rising sea levels, ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, and extreme events such as severe heat waves, droughts, wildfires, storms, and floods, which threaten, if they've not already damaged or destroyed, the mental and physical health, livelihoods, and lives of billions. And I'm, of course, quoting here from Mark Maslin's work. For just one example, look at what's happened in Pakistan this year. Record heat waves and drought, followed by torrential rains that left a substantial fraction of the country underwater and displaced more than 30 million people. The threats to regional security are, of course, substantial, and the threats to global security even more significant. Here, too, I'd argue literature, cultural history, has much to offer. And I'd like to speak very briefly in my few remaining minutes about a work from the Philippines, the octolingual, or eight-language volume, Agam, Filipino Narratives on Uncertainty and Climate Change, from 2014. This volume was published in response to Typhoon Yolanda, November of 2013, known outside the Philippines as Typhoon Haiyan. Typhoon Yolanda was one of the strongest tropical cyclones in history, killing more than 6,000 people in the Philippines alone and displacing millions. In Agam, Filipino artists, writers, and thinkers draw attention to connections between the dynamics of past empires, current neocolonialism, and environmental injustice, and the destruction wrought by climate change now and in the future, as well as our responsibility to the future. One telling example is the Cebuano language poem Cruce by Marjorie Abasco, of a Saiyan writer. In a section titled Questions and Anxieties, she impersonates, or the poet impersonates, a fisherman who talks about the strengthening of typhoons and talks about how the usual fishing grounds are dying, who talks about how these changes are caused by foul smoke from the big and rich nations of the world, he says, we see the sea slowly eating up our small islands. At high tides, the waves rise beyond the highest leaves of the pagatpat on the shore. And pagatpat are very tall trees. Who knows, he says then, what will become of our livelihood? As Vasco's poem, Cruzze, suggests, many writings in Agam are concerned with both intergenerational ethics and transnational justice, key concerns of climate philosophy and ethics. Sheila Cornell, in her essay on natural disasters in Agam, condemns the absence of real solutions, which leave future generations especially vulnerable. She says, we in the Philippines live from disaster to disaster. Somehow we survive. Band-Aid solutions, scotch tape remedies, public policy like the jeepney, a triumph 
of creativity jiggered from scrap. It's noisy, dirty, even deadly, but it gets us there. Well, maybe our luck will hold, but at what cost? We have no answers for the children, not even, not even an assurance that they'll be safe from the next storm. Similarly, in the essay in Agam, Where Will I Stand? Abia Honasan speaks first of the immediate aftermath of Typhoon Yolanda before quickly pivoting to present realities. Summer's hotter than ever, droughts followed by flooding, the sea is far less abundant, all-encompassing poverty that prevents her from going to school. And she concludes in a plea for intergenerational care, I wonder where I'll be when I'm Papa's age. Will the sea swallow us up? Will the sun be so hot? It will burn everything. Where will I stand? Will I be standing at all? Her fears, of course, are not unwarranted. The contributions to Agam by writers mostly unknown outside the Philippines capture well dynamics shared in a range of narratives from Asia, including from some of the continent's most established writers, including Indra Sinha, and of course, the works of Amitav Ghosh, as well as Tawada Yoko. So going forward, I'd like to call on us all not only to continue and expand on Ezra's legacy, not only to examine Asia in a global context and examine global challenges through the lens of Asia, but also to work assiduously to remove the barriers that are preventing our students from doing the same. Far too frequently, the hiring we do, at least in the academy, continues to be single nation based. Our best and our brightest and our most expansive thinkers often must contort their work to fit narrow definitions of field and therefore excellence. So many of us here are senior scholars, we're leaders in our fields, and I ask that we continue to do, in the spirit of Ezra, whatever we can to create space for the next generation, which, at least in my own field of literature and cultural history, is really chomping at the bit to do more transnational work related to Asia, but all too frequently is prevented from so doing. They're prevented from doing the types of transformative transnational work of which they're fully capable and which our world and academia so desperately needs. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Karen, for uh, bringing uh, gender justice and uh, climate justice uh, squarely uh, into focus in our uh, discussion. And also, uh, you know, uh, 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 Ezra was a great scholar, but uh, as a uh, human being, the adjectives uh, that come to mind are exactly the ones that you used. Uh, we knew him to be a very kind and generous uh, uh, human, human being. Uh, we had intended this uh, panel to be truly interdisciplinary, and I think we have delivered on that. But now we come full circle. We had uh, a political scientist talk about India, China, rising powers, and now we have a practitioner uh, from the field of uh, diplomacy to return us to that uh, theme, Ambassador Shamsaran. You mean to the more depressing theme. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and uh, I would like to thank you for uh, inviting me to this gathering. I, I feel somewhat like an interloper, precisely because I'm not an academic and not a scholar. Uh, but I must confess that, um, you know, in my uh, duties as a diplomat in Japan, uh, also uh, in China, um, in fact, uh, Ezra Vogel was uh, a, a, like a guiding light because a uh, lot of insights uh, that he was able to offer uh, in both his books. Uh, when I was in Japan, actually, it was the time of Ishihara, a Japan which can say no. Um, you know, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a different time in Japan those days. Uh, and then later on in uh, China, I was serving in China at a time when the Cultural Revolution was still going on. Uh, I was there from 1974 to 77. And then when I went back to China from 83 to 86, within a six year span, the kind of dramatic transformation that China had undergone, uh, when I arrived back in China, I had completely been disoriented because of the kind of change uh, that had taken place under Tang Xiaoping. 
And therefore, uh, you know, later on, uh, reading uh, Vogel's book on Tang Xiaoping uh, was, in a, in, a, in a sense, you know, um, decoded for me, uh, you know, what his leadership was all about uh, in bringing about that transformation in China. So even though I did not have any personal uh, association with uh, Ezra Vogel, I certainly salute his memory because uh, I think his scholarship uh, and his insights uh, were also very, very important for uh, practitioners uh, like me. Um, we are talking about uh, Asia uh, in, the, in the global context. Uh, so I have served as a diplomat in China, in uh, Japan, uh, Indonesia, in uh, Myanmar, and also in uh, Kathmandu. So uh, much of my career was, in fact, uh, in Asia. Uh, and what struck me uh, serving in all these uh, countries uh, was precisely the fact that, uh, you know, you, everywhere you went, uh, you saw the colors and echoes of a age of Asia which was far more interconnected, uh, which had far more sort of easy flows of people, of goods, of trade, and very importantly, ideas and culture. Uh, so for me as an Indian, uh, you know, just walking the streets in a country like Indonesia, and you see the colors and echoes of India everywhere. And yet it is not Indian, you know. Uh, what you see is a certain cultural spark which may have come from India, uh, but you know, uh, it is the local genius which gave it the efflorescence uh, that you actually see, the kind of a, a, a very distinctive identity, uh, which is, has inspiration from India, but it is not quite India. And I think uh, you know, what really struck me about Asia was that you had this interconnectedness, uh, and long years of interconnectedness, uh, and yet you see plurality everywhere. You see diversity everywhere. And that is what India is all about, in a sense. Uh, you know, it was familiar to me. I felt comfortable in that because my own country has been so diverse, so plural in character. Now, uh, what I certainly take from my experience in this region uh, of Asia is that although we had had that history of interconnectedness, of great cultural affinity, uh, which you see even today, and some examples have been uh, cited, um, we also have to recognize that Asians themselves today know very little about other Asians. And this is what I came across, for example, in dealing with China. I have studied the Chinese language. I have served in China for nearly six years. Uh, and yet, could I say that I really understood China? Uh, could I really say that I was able to do a much better job of policy making with regard to China uh, because of this experience? Uh, I soon discovered that it was not the case. Because unless you put policy in that larger historical and cultural context, uh, it is very difficult to do a good job of foreign policy making. And I think that is what perhaps in Asia also is lacking. Uh, that we think we are Asian, and therefore there is really no need to try and study each other. Uh, but I think uh, we have been talking about here how America should understand uh, Asia, how America should understand Southeast Asia. Uh, very rarely do we hear Asians talking about how they should understand Asia. Uh, so that's one lesson that I take uh, from my experience, that uh, I think um, we should be able to go back to that period of that interconnectedness, of that cultural affinity, but not take it for granted. Because we live in a very different kind of world. There are inspirations that we can draw from that history, uh, but it is not that that is sufficient. Uh, there is much more need uh, for engagement, for understanding. Now, uh, having said that, uh, let me uh, try and give you a sense of, uh, because I think that might be of interest to you, is about uh, you know, India and China, because these two are 
the big actors uh, on the Asian landscape and how they manage their relationship is going to have an impact with regard to the future of uh, Asia. Uh, so this is, of course, a practitioner's uh, perspective. I would like to thank Panjari for uh, making me understand why I was doing things that I was doing as a diplomat. <laughs> um, so what uh, we see uh, with respect to India and China, of course, we had a very traumatic kind of a war <coughs> in 1962. The relations virtually froze uh, for several years. Don't forget that just before that, there was also a sense in both India and China that this was the time for an Asian resurgence, uh, that this was a time where perhaps India and China could together uh, lead that Asian resurgence. Uh, you know, Nehru's whole idea about, you know, the Asian relations uh, conference, the Pandung conference, all these were inspired by that idea that Asia's time had come. Uh, and that resurgence of Asia, coming back to the center of, of uh, global affairs, uh, would in fact be led by India and China. Uh, but because I think of the challenges of national consolidation, uh, the challenges of uh, economic development, uh, that particular vision, uh, in fact, uh, was, was in a sense aborted uh, and it, from 1962 onwards, uh, for several years, you know, that, that, that uh, whole idea went, uh, receded into the background. Uh, when India and China picked up the pieces again, uh, this was something, sometime around the uh, middle of the 80s. Um, China reached out to India, India reached out to China. Uh, and uh, Rajiv Gandhi, the Prime Minister of India, went to Beijing uh, in a very path-breaking trip in 1987. And he met Tang Xiaoping. And Tang Xiaoping told him that, you know, we are talking about an Asian century. But can there be an Asian century if we do not have both the rise of China, but also the rise of India? And he said there is enough space in Asia for both China and India to grow. And this is the basis on which we should be really uh, you know, uh, managing our relations in the future. And to be fair, for the next uh, you know, three or more decades, Essentially, India and China decided, okay, we have a border issue. We have, you know, differences uh, in, in respect to uh, how we look at the world. Uh, but there are enough reasons for us to be able to work together. So let us manage the border dispute. There were several agreements on peace and tranquility uh, for the border. And uh, as late as 2015, when I went to Beijing for one of the conferences, uh, and already the uh, you know uh, China-U.S. relationship was becoming uh, somewhat more somewhat more uh, tense, uh, there was a Chinese vice foreign minister who turned around and said, "You know, why can't we manage our relations like we do with India?" You look at the relationship between India and China; we have differences. We have an active border dispute, and yet we are such mature countries. <laughs> we are able to, you know, handle this uh, this uh, uh, rather fraught kind of a uh, relationship so well. This is the model which other countries who may have differences uh, they should follow. Uh, that came to an end very quickly. <laughs> So while we are talking about you know the the aspect of affinity, we are talking about the aspect of you know Asian identity. We are talking about you know the promise of some kind of a federal Asia. Uh, we are talking about how Asia would become a kind of an ocean of peace and tranquility. Uh, I think we have to keep in mind uh, that the real world out there is somewhat more difficult to manage, somewhat more conflict written, uh, written than we think it is. Uh, so in terms of the India-China relationship, just to conclude, uh, because I did, as, as Professor Sugata Bose said, I did a, a recent book on, on China. Um, the, uh, 
the trajectory of India-China relations in the last few years uh, has been very interesting because I was Foreign Secretary at a time when perhaps India-China relations were at their best uh, in a long time. Uh, this was around 2005, 2006. Uh, there was a Chinese Premier Wan Xiaopao who came to India and there was a, a certain consensus which was put forward. One, India is not a threat to China. China is not a threat to India. Uh, China sees opportunities in India's growth, and India should see opportunities in China's growth. Even though we have bilateral differences, but today, in today's world, as the two largest emerging economies in the world, we have actually convergent interests. There are things that we can do together which we cannot do alone. Reform of the multilateral trading system, uh, how to deal with cybersecurity, uh, how to deal with space-based assets, uh, how to deal with climate change. You know, I was also a chief negotiator for India on climate change. And up to the Copenhagen summit, China and India were actually working together all the time. So there was this sense that there were also global issues, cross-cutting issues, on which India and China could work together. Uh, then I think politics took command in a, in a, in a real sense. And uh, China began to think in terms of how there was actually an opportunity uh, for a China, I would not say dominated perhaps, but a China-ordered universe, first in Asia and perhaps in the rest of the world. Uh, and there is, to my mind, China's sense of power is very hierarchical. And therefore, multipolarity is something that a powerful China does not think is the best way of you know, uh, ensuring peace. So if it is hierarchical, then every entity must know its place in the ranking order. And if that is not accepted, then that is a cause for conflict. Uh, so as far as uh, Asia is concerned, uh, I believe that China is making a mistake because whatever may have been the history of China being a dominant power in Asia, perhaps, but today Asia itself is very different. It is a very congested geopolitical space. It is a space which is dominated by several major powers. You have Japan, you have you know, India, you have Indonesia, you have ASEAN, uh, you have Korea, Australia on one side. Uh, so it is a very, as I said, a very congested and a contested geopolitical space. So any effort by China to try and dominate this space is not going to work because there will always be a countervailing response. So when we are talking about, say, the Quad, what is it? It is a countervailing response. So I do hope that through this, this kind of you know, tussle which is taking place, uh, we will come to a conclusion that you know, perhaps a multilateral economic architecture, a multilateral security structure is what will work in the future. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also for you know, pointing out how uh, the relationship between India and China had shown such great promise in the 1950s uh, for that uh, to evaporate uh, during the 1962 war or even slightly sooner uh, from about 1959 onwards. And then again, sort of at the turn of the 21st century, uh, there seemed to be hope that you know, India and China might be able to uh, manage uh, its simultaneous sort of rise, but things haven't quite uh, gone uh, to, to expectation. And uh, in fact, I just wanted to point out that I begin a chapter uh, of my forthcoming book, Asia After Europe, uh, by describing a 1953 cultural performance by Indians in Beijing. And uh, Chairman Mao Zedong was there uh, sitting unobtrusively in the fourth row wearing his uh, trademark uh, blue coat. And Chu and Lai hosted a, a banquet. And uh, one of the lead singers was a great exponent of Tagore's music, Debo Brato Biswas. Uh, he, uh, but he sang a 
sort of a revolutionary song by another Bengali poet, which has a punchline, Vidroho Aj Vidroho Chari Dike, rebellion everywhere, and so on. And Chu Enlai asked him to go and sing that song all over China and so forth. <laughs> uh, so, you know, quite apart from uh, the political leaders in the states, uh, there were a whole range of civil society initiatives and meetings and conferences around the time of Bandung. Uh, now, I'll give the panelists a quick opportunity if they wanted to uh, raise questions among themselves, or perhaps Monjuri can put me right on the Southeast Asia Initiative of the 1990s. But I want to very quickly go to the audience uh, because we've had a very engaged but also a very patient audience, and I'd like to take a, a few questions. And I imagine we should stop this panel at 5. Is that? Yeah, we started at 3.30, yeah. So uh, did you want to? Um, yeah, I, I, just on the ASEAN thing, uh, yes. because you were asking about uh, the 1990s, uh, Narasimha initiated the Lukis policy, but there was a lot of frustration at that time on ASEAN's side, because ASEAN really uh, wanted India to move into that space uh, in the 1990s. Uh, they were very worried about China at the time, and there were a lot of overtures to India that the Indian government did not fully respond to. Uh, and you can see the rebooting of the policy under, under Prime Minister Modi is Act East. Uh, you know, which is kind of a tacit acknowledgement of the of the uh, demise of Luke East. Uh, so I'll, I'll just stop it there. But I, I do think, uh, I want to respond to what Ambassador Saran said, which I think it's so interesting, uh, the point you made about, about how China uh, sees India and what changed. And I wonder uh, to what extent uh, it has been that China sees India so much through the framework of its relationship with the United States. And so that filter, I think, has has resulted in a very skewed perception where I think you're absolutely right. I think Asian countries don't understand each other. And I do think that there is a significant gap in understanding uh, between China and India today, not just today, but even in the past, uh, where there really wasn't, I mean, if I really get to academic exchanges and scholarship, there really wasn't much, even in the 1990s and, and, and 2000s, that just never happened. It was there much earlier in pre-colonial times and then uh, you know, post-colonial. Uh, that those kind of academic exchanges never actually happen. And it's really interesting because those exchanges did exist between the United States and China. So this plethora of scholarship that actually takes place, um, you know, after Nixon's visit, uh, in mushrooms and grows uh, in the United States as well as in China. But that kind of ballooning never, ever happened uh, between China and India. And I'll stop there. Yes. Yeah, just to say that, uh, you know, uh, certainly the prism through which China today uh, judges not only its relationship with India, but relationship with virtually every country is, in fact, through the uh, prism of its relationship with the U.S. Uh, this point has been made, uh, for example, to me in my interactions, uh, more recent interactions with uh, Chinese colleagues, uh, and I point out precisely what you said to them. I said, even today, with all the tension between China and the US, look at your trade volume, look at the exchanges which still take place between Chinese scientists, US scientists, academics, and you look at what there is between India and the US, and you will see how small a fraction it is of what is happening with China. Uh, so wait until we get to that point, and then you please complain to us. Do any of the other panelists feel impelled to pick up any of the points that have been made? If not, I'll bring the audience into the so, conversation. And uh, who has the first question? Yes. James. Hi, thank you. It'll come on. It'll come on, yeah. Give it a sec. There we are. Um, thank you for this great panel. I wonder uh, what the panelists see as some of the tensions between Asia as a region, Asianisms that we've been talking about, and the idea of the global south or the third world from the Cold War. Um, and there seems to be a, sometimes a, a sort of tension between the sort of thinking about things regionally versus thinking about things globally. Uh, and I wonder if you could maybe expand a little bit more on that. Would uh, Eng Seng or Aniket want to take that? Of course, even going back to Bandung, which was mentioned, it was an uh, early conference which was an Asian-African conference um, with 29 states, 23 Asian, 6 African. 
even though I have been somewhat critical of Bandung myself for already uh, having a bit of a statist bias uh, because the, the anti-colonial movements of what we now call the Global South uh, did not uh, get a seat at the table. It was for states to come together. And if we think back, even Malaysia was not free. Madeka hadn't come. Uh, most of the African freedom movements were left out and so forth. So there was a bit of a tension, I think, even in the, that conception of Afro-Asia and what you're now describing as the Global South. But uh, Oniket or Eng Seng might have uh, something to add. Uh, I will confess that I don't like the term Global South. Okay. Never have, and I still don't like it. <clears throat> it seems to be a juxtap uh, bunging together of two things. One of Willy Brandt's... Uh, split of the world between North and South, and the other being a notion of, uh, well, whether it's Bandung, Third World, and so on. And it, it uh, one of the things which I don't like about it is that the term global has become something which, until recently, was a very nice term to have, and everybody's inflow, uh, ego could be inflated by, by being associated with global. And so it was yet another thing which, the West pioneered, you can say easily say, the Washington Consensus, which the South then wanted to be part of and claim as part of its own. So the whole, uh, to me, psychological aspect of it is, is actually quite uh, unattractive. <laughs> yes, but you are very critical of what happened in 2016, whether in the UK or uh, the United States, and you were also quite sharply critical of what you described as Biden's Brexit moment. So even if you don't like the phrase Global South, I imagine that you have something positive to say about global interconnections that have been interrupted yes, in the last yes, five yes. years. So, so, so when I spoke about global in my talk, I meant very specific, specific things. Yeah. Very specific things being globalization as this double deregulation, the end of the Cold War and so on, and the economic growth that happened. Uh, along that path, and not simply global as something. I th think you can use the uh, phrase which Ambassador used, which is the third space. Third space, yes. Onika, did you want to add something? No, no, okay, uh, yes, please. Uh. Thank you. I wanted to ask a compliment to that question, primarily, I suppose, for Manjuri and for Ambassador Saran, and that is, how the, the legacy of Bandung and the, and the five principles of peaceful coexistence inform the diplomacy between India and China today. To what extent do Indian diplomats try to leverage a sense of common Asian identity in order to shape the uh, environment for Chinese decision making? Wow. Um, I, no. I would, I would actually love Ambassador Sarah to answer that question because I would love to know if that's ever brought up in negotiations. I, I will say that, you know, I know you talk about Bandung and, you know, it was, it was status, but, you know, Bandung is also where the relationship between China and India begins to fray, right? That is the, that's, I mean, that's China's, Bandung is China's, I mean, let's remember this time that the, that this, the China's place in the United Nations is occupied by Taiwan at this point. Uh, China is not in any international institution. So Bandung is the first time Zhou Enlai addresses, you know, uh, makes a global address, so to speak. And so um, I think what's really interesting is the, the solidarity that exists up until Bandung. I mean, Nehru, I mean, you know, and maybe Ambassador Sarah can confirm this again, but I have been informed by several um, uh, senior Indian government officials that, uh, you know, the United States offered uh, India a permanent seat on the Security Council. Uh, that uh, that Prime Minister Nehru turned down in solidarity with the People's Republic of China because they were not given a place uh, in the UN because that seat had been given to Taiwan. Now, of course, you know, anytime, if you bring that up today, the BJP almost sputters in rage because it's like one more mistake that Nehru has made. <laughs> um, but, you know, but Bandung, but then when you get to actually Bandung, uh, you know, there's, a, there's almost a, uh, you know, this is where Bandung is so important to Jawaharlal Nehru. You know, he's one of the organizers of the conference. And, you can see in, in diplomatic transcripts how anxious he is for this conference to succeed. And the way he talks about China and Zhou Enlai, um, and I think that's, it's not received well in China because there's a sort of you know, patronizing, let us introduce you to the world and shepherd you in. And that, that, that uh, attitude, uh, you know, uh, I think is, is an indication of the fraying threads even at Bandung. And then of course, 
After that, you, you know, this the relationship starts deteriorating, and then 1960 uh, is the last time the two countries negotiate uh, before the border war in 1962. I personally would love to know if you ever bring up an Asian, uh, Asian identity yeah. and solidarity in negotiations. So, number one, uh, I think it would be uh, fair to uh, say that uh, uh, at least in the, in the current uh, sort of discourse between India and China, and certainly the negotiations that I have been involved in. Uh, I have not heard the phrase punch shield ever mentioned or the Bandung spirit ever mentioned. Uh, it has been much more contemporaneous in that sense, the discourse. Uh, secondly, uh, this sense of solidarity that uh, Nehru tried to, tried to project, I don't think it was more the sense of solidarity as much as a sense that uh, you know uh, the United Nations should not become a forum for great power you know confrontation. That India wanted the UN to succeed because it was in fact the rule-based order which would work in India's uh, favor. Uh, and certainly, there is no. So far, we have not been able to find any archival evidence that a offer of a permanent seat. Uh, to India at the cost of China was made by the US and that India said no in solidarity with China. I think Nehru, for all his faults, was very realistic about China, very realistic about the threat that he perceived in the future uh, from uh, China. Uh, I think that part is not usually seen uh, by people, but uh, that is very much uh, there. He was, he may, be, have, may have been uh, somewhat of a realist in some one sense, but he was also very, very, very practical and realist in, in, in another sense. And the real deterioration of uh, relations between India and China was not so much the, you know, the contestation which Chow in Lai felt uh, from, from uh, Nehru, but it was Tibet. I mean, the, the, the uh, issue which really brought about a break between India and China. Uh, other issues could have been handled, could have been managed. But this was something which for China was almost an existential threat, uh, which they thought India was behind. You know, um, there's one other aspect of Bandung that is often sort of missed out. And I think today's China may have something to learn from Chiu Enlai's approach in 1955. When the conference began, there were sharp criticisms of uh, what Ambassador Chan referred to yesterday, uh, the, you know, of uh, China's attempts to uh, support insurgency movements in Southeast Asia. And Norodom Sihanouk of Cambodia, Wan Waithya Khan of Thailand, were sharply critical of China. Now, Chiu Enlai simply put on his charm offensive, met them in his bungalow, and somehow, you know, disarmed that particular kind of offensive on the part of some of the Southeast Asian uh, representatives. And it's also worth remembering, you know, sometimes we equate Bandung with non-alignment. But in fact, uh, there were, you know, a whole range of Asian and African states which were present, including the Philippines and Pakistan, which had already joined the US-sponsored CIATO, the Southeast Asia uh, Treaty Organization. And one other aspect of Bandung that is sometimes uh, forgotten is that it also allowed Japan to re-enter the field of Asian uh, international diplomacy. And um, the person behind it, of course, was uh, Mamoru Shigemitsu, who was the foreign minister at, at that point. He didn't himself come to Bandung. Instead, an economics minister came. Uh, but this was 1955, and the year later, um, a year later, in 1956, uh, Shigemitsu, as Deputy Prime Minister, uh, led Japan uh, into the United Nations. And so, you know, in some ways, even though I've sort of criticized the statist bias, there were Asian leaders and Asian states which showed great maturity in at least, despite all of their differences, issuing a common sort of uh, agreed communique, China was not worried about, you know, Panshil being expanded to 10 principles if necessary. They were being accommodative at, uh, at that stage. 
But I think we have run out of time. We have a final panel on Ezra's uh, uh, legacy. Uh, so I would like you to join in me in thanking all of the panelists for their contributions. <laughs>